Welcome to the Ticket Podcast. The Ticket Podcast is a motivational and educational podcast created to inspire people to chase their dreams and achieve their goals. We sell tickets to health, wealth, and happiness. The only question left to ask is, what's your ticket going to be? This episode of the Ticket Podcast is brought to you by the Sports Business and Leadership Association. Members of the SBLA believe that charity is a contact sport. The SBLA is a 501c3 nonprofit that provides underprivileged children unique sports experiences. You can visit the SBLA website at www.nationalsbla.com and visit the gift shop to wear your support. Today's ticket is with Casey Edgar. Casey is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School and where he played football. After college, Casey moved to Wall Street to work for UBS. In 2013, Casey made the move to Barclays and became one of the co-founders of Roan Apparel. Casey currently lives in Santa Monica, California, and is a dedicated husband and father. Welcome to the Ticket Podcast. Today we have a very special guest, number nine on the field, number one in your hearts, Mr. Casey Edgar. And Casey, in my opinion, lived kind of the athlete dream that I have for my children, which is Casey played football at the University of Pennsylvania and was a star in the Ivy League and for his team, team leader, team captain. And he went on to work on Wall Street. He got a job right out of the University of Pennsylvania at UBS. And now Casey works for Barclays. And he's one of the co-founders of Roan, which I'm assuming a lot of people listening to this will have heard of, have bought products and love it. So welcome Casey to Ticket Podcast. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. It's nice to be on the podcast today. Yeah, and kind of the point of the podcast, as we've discussed in the past, is that we tell stories of success and how sports were a ticket. So just from a high level or whatever you want to say, how was sports, and particularly playing football in an Ivy League school, your ticket to success both on and off the field and just personally and as a family man? How, how did sports and football help you become who you are? Yeah, I think, I think there's many facets of sports, um, you know, that you learn and that you develop over the years, you know, as a young athlete, as an athlete in high school, and then obviously playing in college, and then for those lucky enough to play after college, I think there's many, many things that you can develop from sports that are critical to business and, and life. Um, you know, I think for one, uh, sports teaches you how to be a leader. Uh, it absolutely helps you develop confidence and it absolutely helps you develop, uh, you know, better leadership skills across the board, not just from, you know, leading in front if you're a captain, but also just developing the confidence to, you know, lead in whatever asset of the, of the game you're involved in, whether it be football, basketball, baseball, wrestling, you know, any sport, uh, no matter what sport it is, uh, it's just as important to follow as it is to lead. And so, uh, I, I'm a firm believer that in one of those two positions, you're always leading or always following because you learn the traits of the others. Um, you know, whether it's listening to a coach or taking instructions or, you know, respecting authority and developing patience. If you want to lead, you must learn to follow. Um, and, uh, and I think that's really important in sports. And I think that's, you know, at the end of the day, what allows you to develop and build confidence, um, which you can take with you, you know, throughout your life. Um, you know, a lot of people understand that success requires hard work and, you know, I think consistent hard work, uh, leads to improvement. And, um, you know, in my life, uh, I've always been involved in sports at a young age. I've played, you know, many different sports, whether it be baseball or football or, or I've run track or volleyball you know, all these sports have taught me many different things throughout life. Um, but first and foremost, I think what it's taught me is the ability to develop, you know, real true confidence, um, and confidence to take that anywhere that I've, you know, wanted to go in life. And, um, you know, with confidence requires sacrifice. And as any athlete knows, you know, you sacrifice a lot of your time away from school, uh, on the field, but you're also sacrificing that time and building up, um, you know, what I think is probably one of the biggest traits or most successful traits you can have in life, which is confidence and having to deal with, you know, situations that might arise at a time. Um, so you have to spend time on what is important and you have to determine your priorities. And, and in short, I think that's uh, I think that's critical to sports. It teach, teaches you time management and it, it allows you to understand how to, uh, you know, build build your character, your character into your priorities. Um, and for me throughout my life, my priorities first and foremost were always education. Um, my father instilled in me that education comes first. Uh, and then sports comes after that. Um, and in order to succeed on the on the field, I had to succeed in the classroom. 
adults. Um, and so that was a priority of my family. And that, that, you know, I have two brothers and that priority was the same for them. They both played college sports and went to great schools as well. Um, and at the end of the day, I think that's important to, to, uh, to really take in. Um, and I think, you know, as you build, uh, through your, your, as you build through your life and, and understand what it takes to, to be successful in many different arenas, whatever that, whatever your passion, um, pushes you into, I think it's important to know that, you know, there's many different facets of those, of, of that, uh, of your character that you should build. Um, and ultimately that is going to be, you know, success is determined by hard work. Um, and it's not something that just comes as gifted to you. You have to, you have to really work for improvement. Um, and so to me, that was kind of how I thought about my life and education and life in sports throughout the many years. Um, you know, one balances out the other, but you have to work hard in both. Yeah, Casey, you, you mentioned something uh, kind of unique uh, in terms of I'm not sure how many people really, you know, have heard about followership uh, as it applies to leadership. Um, and that's that's a huge thing, actually, within the military um, and, you know, my background at the academy. Um, that was a huge one um, was basically understanding followership to ever be in a position of leadership. Where did you first, you know, learn that? Um, and how have you, I guess, since applied that to your life? Um, I'm sure that you have seen your fair short share of, you know, poor leaders that you did not want to follow. Um, and also good ones that you in turn were able to take some stuff from, uh, and embody, uh, some of those leadership principles. Yeah, I think I was lucky. I mean, it's, it's something that stuck with me for a long time. I think, um, you know, I said I'm lucky because I have two older brothers who, who are 22 months older than me. Um, and so I was always put in the position of following. Um, but through following, I learned how to lead. Uh, because they were older and everything I did in my life was to emulate my brothers. Um, they played all the same sports as I did, and I always played up with them. So in any sport, I would always uh, play, you know, one or two years ahead. Um, and so I was always constantly in the in the following um, role. And, and that's only, you know, the, principally because of my age, but also because of just how I always thought that I developed is, you know, through watching individuals and through looking up to people. And so I think when it was my time to really, uh, you know, take the reins and, and to figure out how I was going to be a dominant player on the field or a dominant player in the classroom, um, you know, I had to learn that, uh, you know, listening to others, always valuing others' input um, and, and always observing others as, you know, situations occurred was critically important to, you know, the ultimate win, um, whether the win is in the classroom of getting an A on a test or whether the win is on the field of winning a game. Um, I think leaders – you know, some of the best leaders are some of the best followers because they're constantly looking around at the landscape and they're, they're assessing the, you know, the, they're assessing who's on their team or who, who they're working against. And ultimately they're able to, they're able to use that landscape to, to figure out, you know, ways to be successful um, or ways to put other positional players in, in a better spot than they might not have been um, prior to that. Um, and so I think those are some of the things that, you know, for me, it was, it was, uh, it was, you know, innate in nature to be a follower um, and then to ultimately lead. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, what I alluded to before is um, it built confidence in me uh, throughout my life, uh, being able to, being able to, to, you know, to play off in life and, and to, to look up to older guys and then, and then ultimately know that when it was my time to, you know, to make sure that I could lead my own uh, as well. Yeah. Something that I think all football guys have heard a thousand times is act like you've been there before. And for, for me, coming from Ohio State, Connor from Air Force Academy, you from Penn, is when you enter as a freshman, you're entering into this just this enormous thing that has existed and has this prestigious history and background and so many players before you, you enter into it and it's just overwhelming and you don't know what to expect. But you have older guys there who have been there before. So when they're saying, actually, you've been there before, in reality, they're saying to you, act like these older guys who have won championships have been there because you need to emulate them to do the same in the future. And it's one of those subtle things that is said to us that you have to kind of pick up and learn, but that little bit of confidence of these guys have got the job done. And if I do what they do, I'll get the job done is, is a huge part of mat maturation and the ability to move on in life and achieve what you want to achieve. Yeah. And I think um, at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that, it all comes from is just having a humble perspective on, on, uh, in everything in life. And I can't, you know, can't say how, how important that is, um, and to be humble, you know, um, 
you know, throughout your life and to understand, you know, that there's always going to be someone that's going to be faster, stronger, smarter, better. Um, but those people that can, you know, put that in perspective and, to, and learn from it consistently will always be the ones that lead and stay focused. Yeah. Is there anything? So Connor played for the Air Force Academy, which is like Ivy League, except for they're training the future of the military, Air Force, and they're creating officers of the military. So that's a very unique thing. At Ohio State, they're trying to create NFL players and also trying to create great fathers, losing community. Anything specific about Ivy League football or, or Penn that you think might have been unique to your situation that maybe Conrad didn't experience? You know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to know only being there. I think when you go into the Ivy Leagues, I think you're required to excel um, in the classroom first and foremost. Um, that is the first and, and biggest priority of, of being at Ivy League school. It's, you know, you're competing with the, the, smartest, the smartest brains in the world that have achieved excellence in school and have gotten their ticket into the Ivy Leagues without any sort of um, athletic achievements. Um, so you're, you're, you're direct, you're directly on parallel with those individuals. Um, and I think that, you know, you t- that, that, that kind of, um, makes you realize that, you know, you have to excel in both arenas. Right. And so if you can excel in sport and you can excel in school at the same time, that's, that's one of the, you know, the proudest accomplishments that any coach in the Ivy league would, um, you know, would hang their hat on. Um, so I think, you know, when I went to Penn, um, my expectation was to continue to be a great athlete and to um, hopefully play as many games and as, and, and as many downs as I could on the football field. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, come out of there with, with an excellent uh, academic background um, and, and prepare myself for the future. Um, and I think that, you know, in the Ivy Leagues, you know, because it is one double A, um, there is a different recruiting ground, uh, you know, to play after than you would get in the one A. There's not as many eyes on you. Um, the talent, uh, arguably, uh, is um, is it's it's still competitive, but obviously the talent is not what you would see in terms of one A across the board. There's still some great players like Ryan Fitzpatrick who plays at the you know playing the NFL now, and there's been many others that have come after him and before him. But at the end of the day, I think I think you know my expectation was when I was going into the Ivy Leagues and when I had looked at other schools throughout high school um, that weren't Ivy Leagues was that, you know, I can, I can get an opportunity to be in the best, you know, in the best spot for education. Um, and, and especially with the Wharton school business in which I attended, and then also be in a great spot to win championships you know, at a very competitive level and play, you know, obviously one double A schools that were top echelon like Villanova and, and Lehigh and, and a number of schools like that. So I think for me, you know, it's hard to know exactly what, what, you know, what the focus is when you go in and, and when you come out, but, you know, it was, it was definitively to achieve academic excellence um, as well as excellence on the field. And I think, you know, the Ivy Leagues present the opportunity to do both of that. And there's plenty of schools, you know, out there that also do that, whether it be Stanford or the U.S. Naval Academy, and, you know, and, and Ohio State in the regards. And, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, those are the things that are most important, um, you know, coming out of there. Yeah, Casey, you kind of hit on it um, going back to, you know, 18-year-old version of yourself. You know, it, it seemed like a very mature <laughs> mature thought process where, you know, I know me coming out is like, dude, where can I play ball and at the highest level? And, you know, ultimately the goal being NFL, if, if that was attainable, but you know, all of the other stuff was, was even an afterthought. And looking back now, um, you know, I certainly had people in my life kind of helping guide that and help deter me from just thinking football or nothing. Um, but you know, from your standpoint, was that, you know, you, that was your thought process all along. Um, was there guidance along the way, you know, I guess kind of just walking through, you know, someone else who may be, you know, 18 year old uh, multi-sport athlete coming out of high school. Um, any kind of advice for them as you've kind of gone that route and now you can look back from a very high level? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I've had some great mentors, the likes of Craig James, who played for the Patriots and obviously SMU. I've had an individual by the name of Robert Wolf, who was an advisor to Obama um, and uh, it was a CEO of UBS Investment Bank and also a Penn alumni. Um, my father was a, was a, you know, the number one um, uh, reason uh, or mentor that I've had in life to guide me, um, you know, down my personal path, which, you know, I'm very lucky uh, to have that type of experience and influence in my life. But I think, I think, I don't know the statistics in regards to, you know, how many players in the world make, you know, the NFL or the NHL or the NBA or the MLB at, you know, after, after college, 
Uh, I think, you know, I heard some crazy stat with MLB baseball that there's, you know, a very low number of individuals that have ever played in the major leagues at that, you know, at the highest level, um, which I found very uh, eye opening. Um, and I forget the, the exact stat and we can look it up after. But, you know, to me, to me, I think, you know, you have to be realistic with your expectations um, and you have to be realistic with the skill set that you have. Um, if you look at, you know, uh, Gronkowski right now and you look at him retiring, you know, at the age of 30 or you look at Andrew Luck or you look at any of these athletes, um, you know, Herschel Walker or, you know, all the great athletes of all time. So your body's going to go through through, uh, you know, a lot of change over the years and it's going to get beaten up, especially if you play football or the sports that you're in. And so you need to preserve your mind and, you know, you can't play a professional sport for the rest of your life. And so when I was in high school, I realized that and I realized that, you know, my ambitions were to be in the NFL and I had all the expectation and all the hope that I could get there with, you know, with my abilities, um, you know, and, and my statistics would tell you that I could probably, I could have probably got onto the field uh, if I, if I truly had, the body or the, the capabilities to do it. Um, unfortunately, you know, injuries play way to that. Um, and and also, you know, I think when you get to a, pers- a, a point in your life and you and you realize, hey, I got to start figuring out what I'm going to do to build my family and to and to make sure that I'm taking care of myself for the rest of my life. What is what is important to me? So. Um, I think that's why you need a balance. And if you look at some of the best NFL uh, players out there right now, you look at a guy like Brandon Copeland, you know, who plays middle linebacker for the New York Jets, and he's a former Penn alumni. You know, he runs the financial advisory uh, group for the for the for NFL athletes, and you know, he's taken a great perspective and, and approach to it. Whereas he wants to excel in the NHL or in the NFL, and he also wants to excel, you know, off the field in the financial service business. So I think there's those two things. I think. You know, at the end of the day, you know, nothing lasts forever. And so you always have to prepare yourself to make sure that you're fully equipped for whatever's thrown at you. And that goes back to, you know, something just in life, right? Whenever you get knocked down, you have to take a step back. You have to re-strategize and you have to figure out how to move forward. Um, and like I said, my dad and my mom actually have been, you know, the main motivation in that. Um, we come from humble beginnings and, you know, we've always, you know, we've always stayed focused on the priorities at hand. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, sports, sports are something that build a lot of character and they build toughness and they build priority. They, they build the ability, you know, to help you prioritize your schedule. And, you know, education, education allows you to think for yourself. It allows you to, it allows you to engage in the real world, right? In the reality when, you know, you're off the field and your athleticism can't shine but your mind has to shine. And so I think it's critically important to make sure you value both things, um, you know, uh, in the same regard. Yeah. Casey. So I have a question for you as, as a father too, is it's something I, so when I first met Casey, we met in Utah at a kind of resort area and we have kids the similar age and we had an absolute blast. And um, I asked Casey's father, you know, you had three sons play Ivy league sports. That's my exact dream for my kids. How'd you do it? And he said, there's no magic formula, but I will tell you this, I never missed a game. And to me, my mom never missed a game. So I think there's something about parents who really believe in their kids and go to all their kids' sports that gives them confidence. And like you said, confidence is such a key to success. It's incredible. So I don't know what the formula is, but something about parents being involved in sports and being there, being attentive, being part of it and having that bond really is incredible. Now, Something that I'm struggling with is is you and I are both very competitive guys. In fact, within 10 minutes of meeting each other, we were racing down a water slide <laughs> to see if you could break the record at the pool. Um, and we did it over and over again until we had a record. So, But we both have sons of similar age. My son, one of my sons is uber competitive, um, which I think is a key to success in life, but also trying to wrangle that. And I think, I think some of the whole – toxic masculinity kind of argument is kind of misunderstood, not aggression, but competitiveness. And I think competitiveness is great. So how do you plan on raising your kids in sports? Do you plan on pushing them into sports or guiding them? Or what is your plan for kind of how to to best benefit your kids through sports? Yeah. You know, I don't think like my dad said, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any, um, you know, per se, um, recipe for success um and if there was one i want to know about it um but you know i think at the end of the day um 
you know, I was lucky. And I said it before, I was lucky to have my parents involved in, in my, uh, in my development. Um, my dad definitely never missed a game and he prioritized his work around it. You know, he would be in New York working and we'd have a game and we grew up in Texas and he'd fly home that evening for the game and he'd fly back the next day. Um, because, you know, I think, I think he felt that, you know, when he was growing up, his parents might not have been there for every game and he wanted to be there. And, you know, They've always been a huge source of motivation for my brothers. And I think, you know, and look, it doesn't have to be a parent. Not everyone's fortunate enough to have both parents or parents with flexibility to be at their games. But what children and young young adults need to understand is that they need to they need to find people that can help mentor them through experiences. Yep. And I think that if it's a parent or if it's a coach or if it's a friend's parent, you know, have someone hold you accountable because accountability is everything. And if you can be held accountable for your actions, if you can be held accountable for how hard you go at something or how you focus on something you're only going to be destined for success you know you have to take ownership of your own destination and that's you know studying hard in school staying involved in the community working hard and playing hard in your sports you know figuring out what you love spending time on and focusing on it is very important if if you have someone keeping you accountable to that then that's even more important and that's even that's even to help you you know in your chances of success and it and it continues throughout your life right um you know as a as a busy father of two kids and and uh you know obviously working 85 90 hour weeks on wall street and then running a company on the side and, and i have a few other things that i work on accountability is the hardest part because prioritizing what you're focused on is is what's important at the end of the day and um you know as an athlete i still i still am passionate about sports i still surf and try to, you know, get to the mountains and I still cycle and I still work out, you know, as consistently as I can. Um, but still at this age, even at 35 years old, I'm still accountable to people that I look up to or mentors that I focus on, um, working with, you know, in the fitness, uh, in the fitness, uh, industry as well as in the health industry. And so, you know, I think accountability is key and, and whether it's through your parents or whether it's through a mentor or a coach, you know, you have to find someone that can keep you accountable. And that's why, you know, you see throughout, you know, the country these days that there, there's big brothers and, you know, out there and, and those guys are trying to keep kids accountable. There's, um, you know, there's, there's, um, organizations like SVLA, you know, and obviously being involved in that regard, you know, trying to keep kids and, and individuals accountable. So I think at the end of the day, accountability is key. And, and, uh, for me as a father, um, I definitely have my children involved in sports. My son plays hockey. Uh, he plays soccer. Um, he's still young, but you know, being at every practice or at least my wife and I at every practice, you know, and, and, and focusing on, um, you know, how he's developing and making sure his passion is in it, not just through exercise and wanting and us forcing him to do it. We want him to want to do it. Right. And, um, that's one thing my dad never, never did to us. He never forced us into anything. You know, when I was in sixth grade, I was a really good soccer player, uh, and I really wanted to play football. And so my dad said, well, if you won't give up on everything you've done in soccer and want to play football, let's try it out. So I did both sports for a season, and then I really enjoyed football. He said, okay, great. If you really enjoy it, go do it. And it was a passion of mine. I loved it. My brothers weren't the same. They really loved soccer. So we split up, you know, sports, and it, which made it even more difficult for my parents trying to get from a soccer game to a football game on the weekends in Texas is, is no easy task. So they would split up time um, and, you know, my parents would figure out which one to go to versus the other. And, and I think that's what it takes as a parent. You sacrifice, you know, you sacrifice what's important at the time and you let your children, you know, lead you in, in, uh, in understanding what's valuable or important to them. And what, and, and as a parent, you know, you know what they're going to be happy in. you know, not every day is going to be, you know, a, a smile on the face when you're going to in, in ice rink, but you know, when he gets off the ice, there's a smile on his face and he's happy that he's there. So I think, you know, you have to listen to your children. I think you have to, you have to, you have to, you know, um, talk about, you know, things as, as a, as a family and you have to be open to, you know, what you want your children to do and what they want to do at the same time. Um, so if that answers your question, I think that, you know, ultimately I think accountability plays a huge role in that. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think wanting your kids to be great at something whatever it is, if you decide to be an artist, you decide to be a soccer player, football player, pilot, just try to be the best version of that you can be. I think that's, that's, yeah. that's key. And then, like you said, having someone that you know cares. And that's one of yep. the benefits of SBLA is, is we're able to expand our reach to show a lot of kids that we care and are offering them opportunities they wouldn't otherwise have because the, the community, the world, America, cares tremendously about the youth. And I think that some kids don't feel that, don't see that, and hopefully we can kind of bridge that gap to an extent. 100%. Yeah. No, absolutely. 
Case, you kind of hit on, I mean, obviously the accountability aspect is, is how you kind of quote unquote, keep your edge, you know, coming from like an athletic standpoint, like how do you, you know, how do you keep your edge? How do you continue that competitive mindset? Um, and it goes into, so just even doing, you know, background due diligence, it's like, I, I kept seeing the the thing with, with Roan, which obviously we'll get into, but even a mindset that it, it, it just hearing you kind of goes forward, which is, uh, forever forward right and that that's yeah. a huge thing in my life i always just call it continuous improvement but i mean it's the the same thought of growth in all aspects of life every single day um yeah and you know i think the listeners would get a, a lot out of just hearing you know how do how do you personally uh how do you do that how do you approach almost every day when you have so much on your plate from your you know like you, you said your your wall street job to your other side gigs to you know huge empires your family um, and then obviously staying active in sports. How do you approach every day and, and keep that edge of forever moving forward? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, forever forward was, was, um, was started because we wanted to provide something, you know, from a standpoint of a mantra that was going to define how people should look at their, their, their life in perspective. Um, and forever forward, the mantra is that is just be better every day, you know, be a better person, do better things, you know, think more positively about the, you know, about the world, about every interaction with people, um, whatever it is, just, just be better. Um, you know, and when, uh, when we started Roan, you know, our focus was on, on encouraging men to, uh, you know, to be better in that regard and, and to think forever forward about their lives. Um, for me, you know, it's not a straight, simple answer. Um, you know, my grandfather had taught me a long time ago that, you know, failure is going to be a part of success. Failure is what builds characters. It's going to make you wiser and it's going to give you experience to do better in the future. Um, and so I just kind of look at every day that, you know, every day I wake up, every day I, I go into work or, uh, you know, I challenge myself and, and whatever, you know, whatever part of the day that I'm, I'm focused on at the moment is that, you know, you're going to experience ups and downs and, and you know what, and life could be, life could be a lot worse or a lot better based on how you deal with those experiences. Um, and so I think from my mindset, it was, you know, I've been around a lot of negativity, uh, in life, whether that be through sports or, you know, character breakdowns or just what's going on in the world, um, you know, politically or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I think that, you know, you just have to have a perspective, um, of being an optimist. Um, and so I think, I think that, uh, you know, having an optimistic pers uh, perspective is, is really critical to, to whatever you do in life. And, um, uh, you know, I think that through my whole background and my beginnings, I've always just been an observer and, you know, I've, I've, I've listened to a lot of people in life and I've, and I've read a lot of, I've read a lot of things that, you know, that have, have opened my eyes to, you know, just how I want to set my days and how I want to set my experiences. And, and like I said, it's no simple answer, but for me, it's just being optimistic. It's just having an optimistic viewpoint on things. And, and, um, and, you know, I had a mentor in college and he always said to me, he said, you know, his quote, and I'll never forget it was every, before every game, he would say, do better than your best. And so if you're always doing better than your best and you're always pushing yourself to do better than your best, then you're going to do well or you're gonna you're gonna find yourself in more positive situations than negative situations um and so i think those are things that just play into into you know how you're supposed to set up your day and and you know everyone's different everyone has different priorities everyone comes from different backgrounds everyone has you know different challenges that they're faced with daily but you know if you don't rest until you're good and and you're in uh you know in your in your your you're doing better than your best at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself in a good spot. Um, and so I just try to keep that attitude. I don't, you know, I don't have a formula for success. Um, and like I said, everyone has different backgrounds. So it's going to, it's going to be about the background that you've, uh, that you've gone through in life or that you're starting in life. But like, if you just focus on doing better than your best every day, then you're going to find yourself in good situations. And so that's kind of how I try to live my lifestyle. Um, and part of what, you know, Roan's message is, is, is forever forward. And, and ultimately, ultimately that's doing better than your best. That's just, you know, stepping up to the plate every day and, and, and taking the right cut and uh, trying to figure out, um, you know, how you can improve each single day. Super cool. Yeah. We had, uh, I mean, with the whole forever forward with, with Roan and what it stands for and being the best version of yourself you can be, being a man who does the right thing all the time is incredible. I mean, we're, 
I mean, one of the cool things about sports is that you interact with just leaders in the world in general. I mean, in Ohio State, we would have speakers come in and talk to us all the time. We had Jim Brown come in one year. We just had, I mean, world champions of numerous sports come talk to us about different things. I remember we had we had a boxer come in one time and he talked about answering the bell of life and how answering the bell and boxing like answering the bell in life is when you hear the bell you stand up and you move forward and you move right. forward until you move you keep moving forward until you win and that yep. was his whole philosophy he's a champion boxer and that was his whole philosophy yep. was you keep you stand up when the bell rings you start moving forward and then that guy has to stop you moving forward and he shouldn't be able to and then we yep. had when we had a you know, politician on and he was talking about the Roman legions and their their warfare mentality and uh, their kind of their naval warships and how their guys rode and you rode and you rode and you rode and you didn't stop rowing as long as those guys were rowing you had a shot to win so it's kind of the same kind of mentality it's it's incredible yeah i agree and i think it's important to, and i think it's important to note too when you're talking about doing better than your best you're talking about yeah you, know, you spoke you just said you just talked about a lot of different people um in in a lot of different kind of facets of life boxing or you know football and, and i think at the, end of, at the end of the day you can't compare yourself to others you just have to be yourself and when you look back like you asked before like if i'm looking back at my high school self and i'm figuring out you know what i want to do um i didn't just you know when i look back i what i was doing i was just figuring out what I love spending time on yep. and I was focused on it. Um, and I enjoyed the freedom of being young and naive. Um, but I focused on what I enjoyed spending my time on, um, under the parental guidance of, you know, the parallels that I needed to be in. Um, and so I think that's important. I think like you said, you know, there, there's no secret to success for any individual we're, we're all unique. So, you know, you shouldn't compare yourself to others and you should definitely be yourself. But when being yourself, you should always focus on being the best version of yourself. Yeah. No, I mean, another thing about the attitude thing also is, is I, I was a captain of my high school team. I was not a captain of Ohio State, but I was still a leader. And something I noticed was when you're in the dog days of, of camp and two days, when life really is very, very difficult, um, just going through the line and giving high fives to guys. You can see the attitude pick up. It's incredible how just a little bit of positivity in a negative situation can lift up the spirits of everybody. And if everyone's high-fiving, having a good time, that practice flies by compared to everyone feeling bad for themselves, being negative. So just little things like that. If you control your attitude and you're positive, I mean, I think you're putting out something – great into the world, especially in modern times. And whatever you put out comes back to you. So if you're putting out yep. positivity, positive people attract to you and, and bring it back to you. Yep. Yeah, and I think I think you said it before. One thing that leaders know how to do, leaders know how to control their emotions. That's critical, you know, in, in, in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So specifically for Roan and being an entrepreneur, um, what about sports and your background helped you kind of take the leap into the unknown of being an entrepreneur and, and what that's all about. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think with Roan, um, you know, and to give a background on Roan, I obviously still work on wall street. Um, and Roan is more of a, it is more of a, a passion than anything else. Um, you know, being around sports for, for the longest time, being one wanted, wanted to be involved in development of, of people be wanting to be in, around, you know, the wellness space, the health space. Um, I got sick coming out of school. Uh, I developed Epstein Barr, uh, which is a tick-borne disease, and it made me reevaluate where I was in life uh, at 22 years old, and, and and try to figure out what I really thought was important in life. Um, and uh, it drains you mentally, it drains you physically, it drains you emotionally. Um, and so when I was going through that, you know. I was evaluating a lot of different things and, and, um, and obviously as a, as an athlete and as someone that's so focused on sports for such a big part of their life, you know, um, I think with Roan, it was really about kind of folding into something that I was really comfortable with. Um, and, and I really had a passion for, and, uh, you know, I do, I obviously have passions for the markets and whatnot and for, for, uh, you know, excelling in a business environment. Um, but I truly have passion for health and wellness. And so for me, um, the ability to 
to take time away from my day job, you know, at night and to work on the weekends for a number of years, um, and to really grind it out 110 hours a week, you know, it was just, it was the mentality of, of, you know, the fact that I just wanted something. I wanted something that was my own, uh, along with my two partners, Nate Checkets and Karis Homestead. You know, we wanted to do something that was different, but that would also challenge, you know, the, the ordinary, right? Um, you have Nike, you have Adidas, you have Reebok, you have Lululemon, a lot of different brands out there, but none of them were doing things specifically speaking to the male customer. And as an athlete, as someone that, you know, has spent my life, you know, on the, on a field wearing Nike or Under Armour or any of these brands, I wanted, we wanted something that spoke to, you know, the everyday male. Um, and so for me, for me and going into Roan, um, I think, I think this thing was that, you know, you want something of your own, you know, you're always going to be working for the man if you're working in a corporate world. Um, and, and ultimately I wanted to distance myself from, um, from the negative thinking of the markets at the time. Um, and so I just had to trust in myself. I had to trust in my instincts and I had to, you know, and put more effort in than I thought I would have to, you know, to develop something that was going to be, you know, something that would actually change men's mindset. And, and we make clothes that, uh, you know, that hopefully inspire men to lead more active lifestyles. Um, my wife's in health and wellness. And so, you know, as a byproduct of her focus, I was really focused on, on that space as well. Just attending her events, attending her classes, attending, you know, um, you know, any type of, uh, social outing, um, with her community. And, and all I saw was a, a huge void in how companies were talking to men. Um, and so that ultimately in short was why we really wanted to develop Roan. We wanted to develop it as a modern voice towards the male, um, you know, towards the, the, the athletic male, um, that has an active mindset. And, and it's not just about being on the field. We don't make any football or baseball or soccer, you know, clothes per se. We make, we make, um, you know, active wear for, uh, the, you know, the, the male that is looking to better, um, himself in and out of, uh, you know, the boardroom and, and on, you know, inside his active lifestyle. And, and I guess, you know, in the gym or whatnot. Um, and it's developed from there. So I think, I think, uh, you know, in no short way, um, the background that I've had allowed me to have confidence to go after something that I thought was totally, you know, out of the norm, um, you know, from developing clothes in China to developing stuff in Peru, <laughs> um, to working through pitch books, to raising money, to challenging some of the big box, you know, companies out there like Nike, Lulu, Under Armour, and, and winning market share. Those are things that I, that I looked forward to. Right. And, and I said it before, I, you're going to get knocked down in life a hundred times. You're going to fail a hundred times. We failed many times around. We failed on shorts. We failed on shorts. We failed on raising money. We've consistently failed. But what it's done is it's made us more focused on the task at hand. And I think that, you know, through sports growing up, like I'm not, you know, not familiar with, with getting knocked down. You know, I've taken plenty of hits in football and I've gotten knocked out. I've had plenty of injuries where I've blown out my knees. Right. You know, my life has been, a, you know, a consistent road of setbacks. And I think that, you know, those setbacks have always paved the way for success moving forward because it's how you attack and develop from those setbacks. And, uh, it's the same thing in business. It's the same thing. And, and, you know, in having that positive mindset, um, you know, if you do choose to be positive, you'll find plenty of reasons to smile every day. Um, and I think through smiling, you're going to find opportunities. Absolutely. KJ, we could do, uh, I mean, the, the whole background and, and where Ron is today, I mean, we could do a whole, uh, how I built this, I'm sure on, yeah, ju- on just, yeah, I don't want to up too much time on, it, yeah. <laughs> on just the story. And, and, but, but even with that, and, and you hit on it with your experiences in sports, you know, handling success, handling failure, um, on, off the field, you know, in sports and life, just through this journey, you know, outside of sports and with, you know, a company that is your own, uh, along with your partners, what would you say, um, has been, you know, the, the greatest success and then also the greatest failure in, in this journey? Um, and, and how did you kind of react and handle both? In terms of Rowan per se, right? Yes. Um, you know what? It, 
I think, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's so many different successes that have come out of the company. I mean, today, the fact that we're still standing, you know, six and a half years later in a very competitive environment um, with two of us doing it part time and one of us doing it full time. Um, you know, Nate Jackets, our CEO, does it full time. I think that's the greatest success is still being here today and, um, and getting past the failure rate. You know, I don't know that the data statistics on how many comp- companies fail within the first year, but it's pretty high. Right. Um, and so I think, I think being here today and, and where we're at, um, you know, as a company with a, we, you know, with a, a big private equity firm helping us develop, um, Hell Catterton, um, alongside, you know, names like Equinox and Peloton and, and, you know, the likes thereof. Um, I think that's one of the biggest successes for, for us as a company, um, and to employ, you know, north of 25 people, um, at this point. Um, but we've had a lot of little successes along the way that you know, I could go into, but I won't. But for me, I think, and if I look back on, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of was, um, you know, the day that we built our fir- first short, you know, we've all worn shorts in our life and you don't know, you know, what you're doing at the time, um, building shorts and, you know, you're getting, you're getting, um, you know, uh, prototypes from China and, and I'm in a small hotel room in New York city at the time with my wife and my two partners and I'm trying them on and I've got bigger than average quads just from football. So, you know, every time I try on a new quad, every time I try on a new short, you know, they don't fit my legs. Right. So it's like, you know, we're trying to build a pair of shorts for an active male, but we can't seem to get the, the fit right. But yet my partner's skin fit in them. So we're going back and forth. We're arguing about this and that we're trying to figure out what the right seams are and what the right width is, you know, everything like that. And then, and I have to take this short and I have to go <clears throat> and I did all of our fundraising. So I had to go raise money based on this short. So when I walk into meetings, I'm like, well, let me see how it fits. And I'm like, well, you got to understand it doesn't really fit my legs because I, you know, I've squatted <laughs> for 20 years. And so I can't really fit in these shorts yet, but for the average guy, you can definitely fit them. So why don't you try them on? Um, so I think for me, one of the biggest successes of the whole thing was having the confidence to, to raise money to actually start a company. Um, you know, and, uh, we, I went out and I raised $1.2 million in 2013, um, just so we could start buying inventory. And so we could start the actual process of having an official company. Um, and then the ability to, you know, to go out and actually sell through our first line, which we did in the, uh, you know, in the winter of 2013, we sold through our entire first line through friends and family. Um, and it allowed us to, to really go forward with the concept, go forward with the idea that we actually were onto something really unique. There was a need for, or a want for, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, higher quality active lifestyle clothes made specifically for men. And mm-hmm. through the processes, right, we've developed shorts that have, you know, wider, wider um, widths or longer inseams or, you know, no, no male is the same. Right. And so like you, you have to, the hardest part of on the retail side of, of a men's company is, is fit. And so finding the ways to make fit, you know, as universal as it can be, is one of the most challenging things I think we face as a company on a daily basis. But, you know, the ability to go out and to actually raise money and, and to have someone believe in something, because I've sold my whole life on having confidence and believing in something and going for it. And it's the same thing when I started on Wall Street. You know, one of my first interview questions was, you know, if you had a if if you had to sell something, how would you sell it? And I said, well, what am I selling? And the guy looked at me and he said, well, you have to sell me this pencil. And I went into this whole diatribe about why he has to have that pencil and why it makes sense for him. And he said, okay. Okay, and then you can actually sell this pencil. And so I think, you know, that goes back to, you know, personality traits and part of me as an individual, you know, growing up and, and obviously being in sports is having the confidence to actually think on hand and, and, and do something with it. Um, and so for me, the greatest success probably, or one of the greatest successes for me was probably, you know, starting the line, being able to actually go out and raise hard dollars around just a product. And people, you know, it was the first time in my life I felt that, like people actually believed in me because they were giving me money to develop something that I was wearing um, and that they believed in, you know, my mindset of, you know, not only, not only should you work hard at your real job in, in, in life and, you know, but you should actually value health and wellness. And if you're going to value it, then, you know, then put your, put your money where your mouth is and, and do it. And, uh, and it's been something that I've been passionate about for a long time. And, and so for me, that was a big success for us. Probably one of the, one of the biggest, you know, the challenges we face, um, or I, I guess downfalls, um, I don't know. You know, it's like, I got, you could, you could talk about inventory, uh, mishatch. You could talk about, um, not having a certain investor, you know, believe in you. Um, 
or you know you could talk about passing a deal up that you know might have been opportunistic at the time um you know i think i think when you look at like companies right like probably one of the biggest uh mistakes um and this is you know off record from my from my day job with barclays uh would be not going to do it full time um and so i you know if that's an out on the question i think that's probably the biggest uh mistake or or you know the, the biggest challenge or letdown because you know when you're passionate about something uh, you should pursue it full time, and I'm in a unique situation where um, you know I can obviously balance both of them. Um, but you know, with family priorities and stuff, you have to think about you have to think about you know that as well. And, and I, unfortunately, I just you know try to do my best to do both of them at the same time, and it's worked out. But um, I think you know one of the probably one of the, the biggest letdowns or something is is not pursuing it in 2013 just full time. Um, and seeing where I could have taken it then, but it's obviously done well, and we've had the right private equity partners involved in it now. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, it's actually worked out for 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 the best. But um, you know, if you're passionate about something, you should fully you should fully go after it with a doing effort. And that's one of the one of the life lessons that I've learned, and that I'll, I'll certainly pass down to you know to my kids and and to those that uh, you know ever ask about you know le- you know lessons in life that you learned. Yeah, cool. if I could pitch Roan real quick, I think as someone who is trying to push the limit all the time as a lawyer, as an agent, as the president of a charity, as a father, I my time is so limited, so tight all the time that anything you can do to increase your attitude, little things like drinking good coffee, wearing good shoes, wearing good suits, buying clothes from somewhere like Roan, all those little things will increase your attitude when you wake up every day and they will make working hard easier every day. So when you're spending a little bit more money to buy Roan clothes as opposed to clothes from Target or anybody else who does not have the same kind of quality as Roan does, you're not investing in yourself. And I think, honestly, if you spend a little bit more money on quality food, quality clothes, stuff like that, you're actually going to get a big return on your investment because your attitude will be better. And if your attitude's better, you'll put that positive attitude out in the world. It'll come back to you and you'll be able to work hard and do a better job in everything you do. And being the best person you can be starts with that kind of thing. So I think to me, I look at something like Rona as an investment in yourself and you will get a return on every extra dollar you spend on higher quality stuff. Thanks, David. And I think too, it's like, it's funny that you said, but in every, shirt that we have or every article um that we make for our own um you know aside from box and and uh and some of the shorts we have quotes inside of our clothes that lead to positive reinforcement um and you know it's it's actually great and, and it makes you sometimes when you know customers will send in a photo uh to instagram or they'll post something and they're like it was having a really down day but you know what i went and got a workout and i looked under i looked at the bottom Bert, and you know there's this really positive reinforcement reinforcement in the shirt a quote you know and and it goes back to our, our vision you know back in 2013 right it was just building positive reinforcement for men in this world always doing better forever forward um and so all the you know all the quotes that we put in our clothes are all positive um quotes that you know that if you just glance at them you know they are cliche but if you glance on them uh, i do think that it it helps you just you know um, pull things back into perspective a little bit well a cliches are true and b i would say this not to get too crazy with it but when i met casey i would tell you casey puts maximum effort in every single thing he does and pride in what he does. So if you take pride in yourself and you buy clothes made by Casey, you can assure yourself that at least you can take the pressure off yourself that you are wearing clothes that were made with pride and passion and purpose. And if you, that's just one less thing to worry about. So I think, I think that's fantastic. Very cool. Yeah, all right, Casey, very much. time for some fun. So we asked all of our podcast people and we've had wide spectrum of every kind of person there is asking these questions. So I think it's really cool is, what is the one movie Casey goes to to pick himself up, to motivate himself either for work or in the weight room? Either for work or in the weight room. Yeah. What, 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 movie, what movie gets Casey jacked up? Well, I don't know if anyone's ever said this before, but it's going to give you an insight into my childhood uh, background of, of wanting to wanting to race dirt bikes and be a BMX rider. But the movie Rad, and I don't know if you guys have heard <laughs> no, of that. No, I've never, I've never <laughs> heard of that. All right, so Rad is one of the greatest movies, in my opinion, of all time. It's a little bit slow. It's the 1980s. Um, But 
it is a true story about passion, grit, and purpose. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's about a young adult male uh, that grows up in a small town that uh, delivers newspapers. And he's a newspaper delivery boy, but Hell Track is one of the biggest ratings of all time for BMX is coming to his town. And Hell Track is, you know, 20 of the top BMX riders of all time. And they go around and uh, they visit all these towns and they raise, you know, profiles for BMX racing. Um, and obviously, you know, it's not a movie that many people have heard, but uh, growing up in Texas, there's, there's, there's only a few things you can do. And, and one of those things is ride your bike on dirt every day. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just absolutely fell in love with two wheels and it, that's carried me through my life. I, I was, you know, I had motorcycles and dirt bikes and, and I just love to, to be on two wheels. And so I, I saw this movie and I don't remember the first time I saw it, but I saw it one time and now, and, and uh, I, actually, I absolutely fell in love with it. Um, and because of the undermining, the, 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 the underpinning meaning to it. And, um, and that is, you know, it's about this local boy that, delivers the newspapers and gets a shot at qualifying for hell track. It's just, you know, the biggest race of the season. Um, and he's pinned against, you know, some of the best riders in the world. He's got to go and, you know, and challenge himself and, and win races and, you know, and get to the, 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 you know, the point where he actually can, can qualify to, to in for the main race. Um, and if you haven't watched it, you have to watch it cause it's a, yeah. it's, it's a fun, it's a fun movie, but he ends up doing it. Um, and, and not to ruin the storyline because it, it, there's a lot in between. Um, but it just shows it's like, you know, it, for me, it was, I always envisioned myself as him, right. Cause he didn't have anything, you know, he would just hang out with his friends all day. They ride bikes. He delivered the newspaper. He knew everyone in town. He was very, you know, he was a very positive person. He helped anyone, you know, that came across his way, you know, at one point, this, at one point in the movie, you know, there's an old lady walk and he holds the door open for her and stuff. So there's like all these small little gestures that are very positive. Uh, he meets a beautiful girl and, you know, they have a great, they have a great experience together and, and a fun time. And she's a, she's the best BMX <laughs> female. And, uh, you know, for me, it's a great pickup, uh, movie because it just shows that anything in life is achievable if you put your mind and you put your energy and effort into it. And they do everything possible in order for him to race. And even, you know, hell track tries to get him not to race because, you know, he's the local boy and he's doing really good, but they go out and they find ways to be creative and do marketing campaigns and sell stuff. And that's where I think I first learned how to sell it too. Just kept watching this movie, you know, about, about the, you know, this local group of guys and, and, you know, this guy and his sister and, you know, they're creating new jerseys and they're selling them, you know, and they're, and they're coming up with like, brands and visions and it's called rad and, and to the day it's my favorite movie that's um, awesome everyone in my family knows it i've watched it probably over you know 500 times um and and uh you know my son will definitely watch it when it's time but it's a it's a really cool inspiring movie um you know that that obviously uh with adversity um it shows that you can get through you know anything got it pulled up right now and uh, it'll be queued later to watch later this week yeah, yeah, Lord, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's a little slow i mean it's in the 1980s but it's pretty awesome no we were lucky i'm telling you we were so i mean i could have thrown out a, a typical movie you know like rudy or something like that but no. you know i don't think many people know about rad so it's, it's one of the coolest movies i think of all time you gave Very us the cool. perfect answer literally but we were lucky i mean tell so i'm 34 you're 35 Connor's a little bit younger than us, but we all grew up in a time when they were making movies like that. Mighty Ducks, yep. Three Ninjas. There was that movie about the Nintendo I can't remember what it's called. But there's, yeah, there's, there's like yeah, cool there's runnings. All, there's a bunch of cool stuff like that. Percent. It's awesome. I mean, yeah. it, it, part of the movie, like one of the opening scenes of the movie, you know, it's, it's really cool. You know, they always race through this like uh, this lumber yard and the cop is always chasing them because they're not supposed to be there. So, you know, they race through this lumber yard and the cop can never, can never catch them. And of course, the biggest supporter you know, for him when he's racing is the cop. The cop's there to support him. He's there to challenge the people that aren't trying to let him get in. And so it's just a unique story. It's, it's a really cool, um, it's a really cool movie that was made in regards to, you know, fitting for today's podcast. Yeah. And Lori really Loft, I just took Connor pulled up Lori Loughlin yeah, from, Lori Loughlin from Full House, that, yeah. Full House yeah. and Varsity Blues fame is the, yeah. the lead. Yeah. Lead, lead woman. So same question, but song, what is the song? you listen to to get you most jacked up to have a productive day at work or in the weight room? Oh man, I don't know. I'm not that big of a music guy. That's a tough question for me. Um, Metallica. Oh, I know man. you're a Metallica guy. Huh? I know you're a Metallica guy. I like Metallica. I mean, 
Um, I don't know. I mean, music. That's like that's a tough. Qu- I might have to come back to you on that. I mean, it's got to be something for Bruce Springsteen. Nice, um, nice. You know, um, or Roy days. Yeah, you know. Um, I'm trying to think born free or you know, I don't know. I, I'd have to come back to you on that. I don't, yeah. I've listened to so many pump up songs that, you know, <laughs> I, I really don't know. I have an answer to that. Yeah. And I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's fine. So, so, so same question. And the last question is, is what books are you reading or read recently? Or what do you recommend to our audience of, uh, inspirational books to help you in business or life or in general? What, what are you reading that you recommend to our audience? I mean, there's plenty of books. I think ultimately that, uh, that you can read out there. And I think, um, you know, it comes down to what your, what your mindset is, um, that you're looking forward to in terms of, um, you know, how you want to develop and stuff like that. You know, there's obviously, there's obviously, um, you know, business books, there's obviously personal books. Um, there's obviously sales books. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, um, you know, it just depends on what your interest is. I think if you had a, if you had to, if you had to pick an interest in terms of how it relates to my um, my background and, and where I'm at, I've always said that uh, you know, or whenever anyone comes to work for me, there's a really good book um, from an author named Daniel Pink, and it's called Drive. It's uh, the surprising truth about what motivates us, um, and I really think that that you know. It's a fascinating book. It's very, it's very provocative, um, and uh, I think for me, it's one of the books that's obviously impacted me uh, significantly in, in the in the you know the businesses that I work in. Um, it's a way that you know kind of makes a convincing case that you know organizations can in- ignore intrinsic motivation, um, and I think that that's what drives individuals. Um, and so that's probably one of the that's probably one of the books I would, I would definitively recommend for uh, you know people on this podcast you know whether it be young adult, adults or or you know people uh, you know professionals. Um, one book that I've always found that was really uh, a resourceful guide for me, um, and this goes towards Roan, and this goes goes towards anyone that has an ambition to sell in life, is an author named Jeffrey Gittimer. Uh, it's called the Sales Bible. It's the ultimate sales resource. Um, and I think that it's a really unique book. Uh, it has ten and a half commandments, uh, basically sales successes, um, and it's something that I I started using at 22 years old, and I still use today. Uh, I still look back on it um, to figure out what I should do if I'm trying to make a certain inroad on a client, um, or if I'm trying to take a different step towards you know a you know an outcome that I'm looking to achieve. Um, it basically it basically helps you understand that most people aren't willing to do the hard work it takes to make selling easy. Um, and that for my job and for what I do on wall street and for, for Roan and for everything that I've ever done in life, you know, my role has been mostly around sales. Um, and so I think that it's a really cool book to, you know, and it's a really easy read, uh, and you learn a lot through, through reading it. So, um, you know, I've always, uh, I've always been a big, big uh, believer in the fact that, you know, nothing happens until a sale is made. Um, and I think this book helps you get to that point. Well, that's it, Casey. I, I appreciate it very much. I think um, the first time I met you, I thought you were a badass. I mean, just and when, and when I say that, I mean, I mean it in the best possible way. Of, oh, thank you, David. I, I think it. that you exude the kind of father I want to be, kind of business person I want to be, and just I think you live a life that people should want to live, which is you're out there working, doing your best in every aspect of your life, which is what I try to do every day, and I know Connor is every day. So. Thank you so much. And uh, just signing off, we uh, this podcast supports the Sports Business Leadership Association, a nonprofit that raises money for underprivileged sports camps so we can get kids and turn them into future cases. Uh, visit there our website, www.nationalsbla.com. Casey, we give us the website for Roan. Yeah, it's www.roan.com. And if you're listening to this podcast, feel free to use the code CCC2019 for a discount. Awesome. All right, Casey, thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Thanks, guys. See ya. And that's today's ticket. Remember, where you're at today is not going to be where you end up. We hope podcasts like this help you find your ticket to health, wealth, and happiness. If you like what you heard, punch your ticket with our team and follow us at Ticket Productions. 
Until next time, get up, get moving, and make a positive impact on today.